What's up, y'all? I'm JJ McCorvey, a journalist who writes about business and blackness. And I'm Shayna Watson, a fashion industry professional and writer with my eye on the social and cultural impact of trends and style. And, and this, this is, is Yo business. business. You know how he does, and you know. I can't say it. Close. All I, I know wanna this already. do is hug you because I like your skeeter. Because it's skeeter. And I dig <laughs> the way you move and the way you do your thing. Skeeter, keep it coming oh, no. on because we love you crazy. See, I, I only know that because I remember seeing 702 in the opening of that uh, show. But I automatically have the real Stilo in my head. Yes. Because that song knocks. Right. <laughs> like forever and all. Always. So funny enough, I was going to do a different one today, but then I felt like I couldn't in good conscience because it's not a black sitcom. It just had two black accessories on it. Oh, accessories. Who? What were you going to do? Different strokes. And I wouldn't have known that. Oh, you didn't watch that? <laughs> no. I mean, did you know about it, though, with Gary I mean, Coleman? I know Gary Coleman. Yeah. What you talking about, Willis. Yeah. But I definitely don't know the themes. Oh. Uh, <laughs> now the world don't move to the beat of just one drum. So I liked mm-hmm. different strokes growing up. Until I got a conscience, and then I was like, oh, like this white man literally just went to a park and scooped up two black kids and like adopted them. Is, was that what happened? That was really? the premise of Mr. Drummond. I like, he just like saw these black kids, and I guess he went through the proper channels, but I don't think we really knew. I hope so. But then it was just so white savior. Mm. And that's why I was like, ah, I can't. Well, I mean, given the current like slate of movies coming out right hey, like fit maybe right in taraji, today. P. <laughs> taraji p could be the new gary coleman right. i hate that movie so hard but you love green book why <laughs> <laughs> i'm sorry i have to because you did i did i enjoyed green book as a feel-good movie uh-huh. but i did not know when i saw it that it was supposed to be based on a true story mm. and that changed everything and then once i knew it was based on a true story and then once i knew that they didn't consult the black guy's family once i knew it was written from the perspective like i didn't know any of that i went and saw it and it felt like a non-trash movie Mm. but then once you know more then you know more so knowledge ruins everything it does and so but this that taraji movie where she's speaking in like basically the jim crowiest of accents and then they become friends in the end i i'm just tired of it hello hi hi I, we <laughs> missed you guys last week like i love the bonus bits because justin had so much to share yeah, but we're so happy cool. to be back yeah me too i missed this yeah this, like brings me life every week i know all right let's dive in let's dive in so we did not talk about Nipsey Hussle, yeah. um, who was shot and killed um, recently. His funeral, the memorial service, was actually this past week. Um, and I'm sure our listeners probably know that Nipsey was a rapper. Um, he was very uh, well known in the community. And he dated Lauren London. Mm-hmm. Um, they have a child together. They have a child together. Um, and he also was like very entrepreneurial. He did a lot for um, the community as far as like teaching people STEM s- skills. And he also founded a um, an investment um, fund for uh, creating affordable housing um, in different cities, which I didn't know. And he actually like got shot like out f- in front of like one of his retail stores, mm-hmm. which was terrible. Um, so I don't know. It, he just seemed like an outsized figure, and it seems like we should talk about what yeah. he did. And you know, I read someone that said we, our generation, was really too young to remember Biggie and Tupac in the same way, and mm. so that's why this kind of resonates with us more. Even if we didn't know him as an artist, even if we didn't know much about him, it's just like chilling to remember how short life can be yeah and how we can be doing all the right things and be in the places where we're supposed to be being doing the doing the things they say we're supposed to do and still be taken so i think that um you know i've read a lot of articles about the ptsd that has come through this of just the same way that when we watch eric garner be killed when we watch trayvon martin's body laying on the ground like Mm. it's just like Man, black bodies are just so, it seems that our lives are so precarious at all times. And this just hit 
yeah. in that way. Yeah, I mean, people really loved him. Yeah. Um, like I said, his memorial was uh, was this past week, and um, it was streamed on Tidal and BT, and they were giving away free tickets at the Staples Center, and all 21,000 of them were gone in 20 minutes of being posted online. Wow. <laughs> which is crazy. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I also know that Nipsey... Um, Face some criticism for some homophobic comments that he made in the past. So there's been a lot of conversation around that as well. Like, how do we, you know, some something that we come back to frequently on the pod. How do we appreciate people's contribution and celebrate their art or appreciate their art um, and still hold them to account? Right. You know, and, and that's how we I, grapple with that. Right. And I think we just have to stop putting anyone on a pedestal like yeah. like we're all human right and in his de- his death didn't make him perfect his death didn't make him an angel it didn't make and i think that's been that's like always really hard to see is that all of the sudden he's like an icon and people were his biggest fans and it's like but you weren't you can still be sad about it and not have to like rewrite history yeah like you know? I, mean, I have to admit like i was not super familiar with his music um right. before i heard about his passing um but uh, um, another writer uh, for The Advocate, his name is George Johnson, he pointed out that, you know, we can, it's it's okay to be like, to grapple with the, the complications of Nipsey's legacy, but let's also remember that there was another person killed um, in the same weekend who was um, a trans black woman, Ashanti Carmen, was was gunned down like the same weekend, and which is an, another issue that doesn't get a lot of um, attention. So um, to your point, like sometimes these um, larger than life mm-hmm. um, uh, pedestals that we give people kind of outshine right and we can be sad when we need to be sad when any life is lost yeah like any so it is sad i i um haven't watched any of it i just like haven't been in a place to do that but Mm -hmm. i can only imagine what lauren is going through and his children so i just thoughts for all of them yeah what else has been going on so disney made an announcement recently and you know I have mixed feelings. Disney himself was an awful human being. Disney Be was specific. very homophobic. <laughs> Disney, Walt Disney was very homophobic, very racist. I've read that Mickey Mouse had a lot of roots in minstrel blackface. shows and blackface. And mm-hmm. so it's just the, the sexism that comes through in Disney movies. It's just a tough company to want to stand behind. Yeah. Um. But they made an announcement that in coming in November, they're going to get into the streaming game with Disney+. Plus. Yeah, I mean, I I feel like this announcement was coming for a while. Um, so I wasn't necessarily shocked by it. What I was shocked by was uh, the very, very aggressive pricing. Like, it's $7 a month. It's going to go nothing. up. <laughs> Remember, how much was Netflix? When we all first got Netflix. It was like $5.99. Exactly. Something. It was cheap. And now Netflix is like, oh, I'm sorry, $20. How much is Netflix now? Like 13 a month? It is. Yeah. It's, it's crazy. It's gone up. Yeah. So, yeah, we and all we just, start low in the and, beginning. Yeah, and we're a glutton for content and punishment, apparently. So we just <laughs> yeah, we'll pay, stay we'll subscribers. Yeah, we'll pay whatever. Um, but yes, yeah, so, but speaking of Netflix, like, um, they, like, the, their stock, uh, dropped like 4%, um, per share, right. um, after the announcement, which was interesting to me, given that, um, they had just raised their prices. Right. Right. But they also Probably just somewhere. released a Beyonce trailer. So it's like, maybe they get to do whatever they want now. Right. <laughs> Cause like, she, are we gonna? She's the bomb. Right? Are we gonna get? Are we gonna stop Netflix before Homecoming comes out? Right, no, exactly. Never. <laughs> I'm. I mean, I, I admittedly am very much looking forward to it. A duh. I love that Coachella performance, and I just know it's gonna be like. So I personally black. went to an HBCU, and I, I'm I'm just imagining like the conversations that she was having with folks, and. But she didn't. How do you feel about? Let's talk about that. Okay. <laughs> Cuz like I just brought that up to to friends recently that like are we is is HBCU culture all of ours? You know, it's interesting. Cuz she um, didn't even go to college. She did. None of them did. Not Destiny Child. Like oh, they wow. they basically didn't do all of high school. Right. Like I remember 
I was a Destiny Child stand. Uh-huh. <laughs> I had posters on my wall and stuff. My dad walking by my room like, uh, son? <laughs> You're like, I'm in love with them. <laughs> right. Uh, right, they're my girlfriends. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah right. Ah, uh, little JJ. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, so the thing about them is they they were into H- I remember like the Bugaboo video mm-hmm. do you remember where like, they were marching oh, on yeah, the field true, true, true. they were like the majorettes or whatever yeah, so they've, they've always been yeah and I mean she is from Houston yeah so that's like a big cultural thing whether you uh-huh. go to the schools or not uh-huh. so okay I feel a little better about that yeah thing. and to me like Beyonce has never been like not black you know, like mm. not not steeped herself in like mm-hmm. black culture, so I hesitate to say you don't. You have no business like mm-hmm. pulling from HBCU culture. Even like even the, the way she dances. Like I remember when a single ladies video came out, and I was like, I know those girls. Like I, that, that choreography came straight from like mm-hmm. marching band. And then majorettes. like the Bootylicious video where they had like diamonds on their teeth and like yeah, yeah, yeah. that's true. But you know, also like being part of a Greek letter organization, a historically black Greek letter organization. It's also just like, but you're doing that and you're not in that. It's just like a hard barrier. But I mean, mm-hmm. it is all of ours. So yeah, I feel. Yeah, I, th- I mean, I don't know if she could rewind time and go back and get her HBCU degree or like join the delta right i mean she could join delta now beyonce (laughs) you just want to be able to call beyonce Beyonce. your line sister whatever beyonce (laughs) if you want to be well the other thing that um i'm curious about so netflix has beyonce Mm -hmm. right and they recently brought on shonda rhimes Mm -hmm. um to create content and channing uh dungy um who um is it dungy or dungy I can't remember. But she was, like, over-programming at ABC, and Netflix hired her away. Oh, okay. I mean, and um, Netflix has so much black content. Yeah. With um, Dear White People. And- but, all, but all the streaming services do, right? So right. HBO, you know, has Insecure, obviously, which I know is streamed a lot. Apple TV announced Oprah and Octavia Spencer as content creators. And then so, like, Amazon just put out Guava Island last <sighs> night. The one with Donald Glover. That's out now. Yeah, that came, it came out right after his Coachella performance. Oh, we should watch it. Out. Yeah, I really want to see it. So, so yeah, you, people are hopping on the black content train. You think Disney's going to do it? I don't. I mean, they can like. Maybe know, they'll give us another princess in the front. I was about to say, they, they can promote <laughs> uh, Princess Tiana. Because that's all we get. <laughs> and maybe Mulan. Right. Um, but uh, in researching this, I also found out that Disney owns Freeform. So I guess mm. by proxy, maybe like they black, get black, not, yeah, not blackish, yeah. but well, actually, blackish maybe too because Disney think, owns ABC. Oh, uh, Disney so. <laughs> owns ABC, Fox. Yeah, so grownish and blackish, Oof. maybe they'll be. So maybe they'll get heart. Kenya. Yeah, Kenya Bears. Yeah, so I'm interested to see. I'm just like you know how we've talked about this, like. Just this mass ownership where eventually we won't be able to turn on anything that doesn't contribute to them feels yeah. scary. It feels like you're taking all consumer choice away. Yeah. But at the same time, the the uh, paradox in that is that it's too much choice. Like, right. I feel like even before this announcement, I've just been feeling like overwhelmed with stuff. Like I, ha- I have literal lists of like... TV shows and movies to watch and like they're increasingly on mm-hmm. all, like a, a lot of like tech investment now is going to, well business investment in general is going toward like original content original programming on these streaming services and it's just like okay like who how much do we need right. you know and yeah. when are you going to actually get to it like my my boyfriend's actually tomorrow night going to like this Game of Thrones party oh right Game of Thrones um, comes out and I haven't I haven't Game of Thrones has been on my, like, watch list at least, like, for, like, five or six years. Yeah. And I just... I'm never going to watch that. Yeah. <laughs> I know you won't. Yeah, no. That's it not up your alley. It sounds so bloody. You didn't even know what Captain Marvel was. Still don't. Moving on. Still don't. <laughs> um. Okay. I want to say my politics thing first because it's making me so tired that I just want to get it out and then we can walk through the rest of it. But okay. So there was so many abortion laws passed this week, and uh, Texas this week passed a bill that could allow women to be charged with homicide after getting abortions. Wow. Ohio was the third state in the U.S. to pass the heartbeat bill, 
which is a bill that bans abortions as early as six weeks, which, mind you, is often before most women know that they're pregnant. You figure a woman has her period every four weeks, not until you miss it often do you think that something might be going on. It's another two weeks. So in six weeks, we're still Mm. figuring it out. And for me, it's... We've had a conversation about this. Like, obviously, I'm a believer, and often a lot of Christians are very uh, pro-life. And I, I am also pro-life in the sense that we should all just be able to live and breathe and pursue happiness. But I'm also pro-leave my body alone and stop dictating what I can and cannot do with it. Mm. And the same people that are fighting about the, a heartbeat in a fetus are allowing children from Mexico to be living in cages and God knows what else is happening to them in concentration camps. Right. And so it's like, whose life are you really concerned exactly. about? You're not concerned about life. You're concerned about controlling my body. Mm-hmm. Whatever I want to do with it is none of your business. Yeah. Like these white men making these decisions and white women, I'm sure, are taking this very personally when it has nothing to do with them. It's scary times. It's I very mean, we, scary. We joke a lot about like Handmaid's Tale. No, but this is how it starts. Seriously. In the beginning of Handmaid's Tale, they say that, that this has been happening yeah. and like the the pro-life Bible toting has taken over and does all this in the name of morality when yeah. it's not about morality at all. Well, the other thing um, that you're making me remember is um, less than a month ago, like Trump uh, stripped funding, more funding from Planned Parenthood. Yeah. I think I, I mentioned this to you. I t- yeah. said it in the text. And the gag you. order. Yeah, it's like you can't even mention. Doctors can't even tell you where to go, which, <laughs> which I say, same way. You know, I didn't learn sex education in my Christian high school and people still had sex. Mm. So just because you take the education and the resources away is not going to stop it. And the fact that we refuse to understand that. Some women get abortions to save their life. We are ignoring all the nuances of why women have to make this very difficult choice. It's difficult. Like, no one is smiling going to the abortion clinic. It's painful. It's expensive. The guilt that comes in afterwards, even if you feel like it was the right choice. And so it's just like you putting a law on it is not going to remove the fact that all of these outside factors are happening. And then how about you make rape a little less appealing because then that takes up you know what i mean it's just like uh yeah i hate it and then as usual when these kinds of laws get enacted uh, or policy gets enacted like the people who suffer most are like black and brown people Duh. and so like if if a woman can't i imagine can't go to planned parenthood you know where she gets other resources too then by you the find ways. another way and then you die of sepsis or mm. you you know what i mean it's just uh, it's very, I, I feel very worked up about it. And abortion is never something I've had to think about or deal with in my life. But it feels very personal in the sense that I have a body that could produce a child. And I also have a body that is in constant danger and fear of being violated and having my rights taken away to do what I want to do with my own body. Mm. And that is so scary. So I just don't really know next steps and I don't really know how to stop it. But it just feels like every day I open and it's a new step towards me not being in control over what happens to my person. Which as a black person, we're already worried about. As a black woman, and I know you also know as a black gay man, it's Mm -hmm. just like, man... Like you the, get like constant reminders that, of like you're not in control of exactly, what and that your, your body <laughs> is just really like it's you're precariously existing still. Mm. So it's tough. Well, what else happened in politics? In lighter so? news, we might get reparations soon. <laughs> no, we won't. Stop listening to Corey. <laughs> oh boy! This past week. Georgetown uh, University, um, their student body voted in favor of a $27 fee that every Georgetown student will pay every semester to fund reparations for the descendants of those slaves. Wait, (laughs) every student? Hold on. Those students say the $27.20 fee would generate over 400000 a year and will be allocated for charitable purposes. So am I paying my own reparations? Um, <laughs> I mean, I 
think it sounds like you know a black student might be paying for it. Hell no! <laughs> I've paid enough. But other, this would be like part of the student body. Um, that's interesting. Okay, but it says even though the bill passed by a two to one margin, there's no requirement that Georgetown must adopt the measure because it, it involves changes to university tuition fees and needs to be approved by the board. But don't you see, you, <laughs> that doesn't feel like a gotcha to you. Look at who's paying the most in student loans in general, yeah. and then you add another twenty seven dollars on there yeah. for me to for what a charitable cause, which probably won't be me because I'm in college. <laughs> Get out of here. That's not how reparations work. <laughs> No, no. Yeah. And I I should have mentioned that the reason that this even came up is because um, it's referencing um, the sale of the 272 slaves that funded um, Georgetown creation. Oh, okay. Um, So it's a little kitschy historical connection. But but, I mean, they don't say that it won't pass you know that that the that I mean it passed but they won't say that the the school itself won't adopt it um well maybe rosario dawson's boyfriend will come and like work hand in hand with them by rosario dawson's boyfriend you mean cory book i love doing that <laughs> I, know you do. <laughs> I just think it's like the patriarchy i just like got to kick you one time right um, why why does why oh why is he talking? This is okay. This is all I will say about this is like Corey feels very um, sticky to me mm. in the sense that he like has a shtick. Like uh-huh. I think whenever he was like whatever he was in Jersey, he like lived in the projects, right? It's just mm-hmm. I think he's and he just, saved people from burning, right? Buildings. And he's very uh-huh. and to me this just feels like the new shtick where uh-huh. he's just like and is my girlfriend. It's Rosario Dawson. It's like. <laughs> Okay, but like, what about the presidency? And as women, we fight so hard for people not to ask us about our our clothes and like if we can balance work and family and right. who we dated. And so, but then you're pushing that out in front when people are actually trying to talk to you about it's just it feels very weird to me. I don't really get his motive there. Well, you know, I mean, she's a celebrity also, and people yeah, like, but is she really getting clicks? Are people like? I don't know. I don't, I don't know think Rosario life. was out here. <laughs> Wait, is she the? Oh no, that was Sana, who bit Beyonce. No, you know Rosario ain't bite Beyonce. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think Sana would. Oh, speaking of Sana, so, quick detour. I saw Native Son on oh, HBO. Oh yeah, I want to see that. Devastating. Good. Like, yeah, it was good, but also very, just a gut punch. Mm. Like. If you, I don't know if you read the book, but it's like a, it's like no, a, do it's a, it's it, a modern take on the book. It's very black, but it's also like, um, it de- it delves it delves into privilege and what like what how seductive pr- privilege and power is, and like how the main character like gets seduced into that. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, I don't want to spoil it for you, but. Yeah, so now I, I play the mama. I do want to see it when someone shares their HBO Go password with me. Then well, I'll watch it. Because I still uh, haven't watched something else on HBO that I was supposed to. Oh, Amanda um, Seals. Yeah, get on it. I don't. I'm not wealthy. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Like is that a... it? Or do we have any good news? <laughs> <laughs> You don't think reparations is a good news? No, because we're not getting it. We're paying twenty seven twenty. You don't want your twenty seven. No, and I won't even get it. If you're talking about charity, I don't fall in the tax bracket for charities. When I actually get something, and then I'm just like really skeptical on what I'm gonna have to prove. Like you, y'all already have my ancestry DNA. Like, what am I gonna have to prove? Do I need to know my slave great great great's name? Like, it's just I'm not I'm not holding my breath for it. Yeah. Well, some good news. Um, Serena Williams is partnering with Bumble, the dating uh, app, the dating app, oh. to invest. And uh, black business women. I thought that was a cool story. What? So Bumble, because I feel like there's a lot of white people on Bumble. Exactly. So <laughs> <laughs> through the partnership, Williams will be, this is from mogulthumb.com. Through the partnership, Williams will be actively working to help businesses founded by women of color receive investments they need to grow. And it's called uh, the Bumble Fund. Hmm. 
Mm, that is cool. Yeah. Go ahead, cool. Serena. Our guest today um, is awesome. And th- that's why we need her, right? Because she really is a professional development and career transition advisor. And so if the workforce is changing, that means the way that we go about getting work and shaping our career needs to change too. So mm-hmm. she has so many helpful tips. Like she's helped us both so much. So come on back, guys. Okay, so today we have Jocelyn Walters, who is the founder of A New Advisory. Woo, so, <laughs> A New Advisory focuses on professional development, thought leadership content, growth execution, diversity and inclusion, talent strategies, and career transition guidance. So, basically, whatever your company or you as a person needs to know to like move up, secure the bag figure out the best way to get the best talent, uh, a new advisory, and Jocelyn will get you there. Can we just start by like <laughs> just running some of the, the, the lists of things that Jocelyn has, has done, done. Yes. to like upgrade our own lives? Yes. Like, she got me eating. I mean, it didn't, it didn't take, but she got me <laughs> eating better. <laughs> She's like she got my hair in protective styles. Protective I never styling. did protective styles before I met Jocelyn. She's negotiated yes, salary. <laughs> She's like help yes. us with our resumes, yes. and she'll like do all this stuff out of her own time, just as a great friend. So we love you, Joss. Welcome to the pod. Welcome, love you guys too. Thanks so much for having me. Of this course, is no. We just this is like one of our when we thought when we were brainstorming of like who are our friends that have that really just have knowledge to share that we don't. You were like first on the list because Aww. these things that you have helped us with. <clears throat> with resume writing and negotiating and just like how to how to conduct yourself when you're trying to have a tough conversation is not common knowledge. Um, so we're really excited for you to share that with us. Happy to. Okay, so I want to hop right in. So can you tell us how a new advisory got started? Yeah, it's it's really a simple story. I think that everyone has some sort of talent or passion that they care about. I enjoyed helping people with certain career trajectories and these other things like making almond milk. Um, (laughs) But I really enjoyed seeing people do well in their career and particularly working in the tech industry that is predominantly white and male. I found it so necessary to help especially people of color who are working in roles that may sort of under represent their ability. Mm. I felt passionate about giving them an opportunity as much as I could to help them get to a place where they're both being paid and recognized for their talents appropriately and on par with their white counterparts. Mm. Right. And so it really wasn't that I was trying to start a company. I, I could tell you I was not necessarily interested in being an entrepreneur. As you pointed out, I just like doing this. It just so happened that I found myself in between gigs and I was like, well, I guess I might as well do this as a as uh, side hustle. Mm-hmm. And sorry, and you talked about working in tech. So can you kind of also explain how that corporate life contributed to you wanting to start your own advisory firm? Yeah, what ended up happening is I left a company and a person I was coaching and helping at that company called me and said, I can't, you're leaving, but I still need your help mm. to do my job that they're paying me to do. Mm. Girl. At, the, at the same company. Yes, right. in the same job I just left. And, oh, gosh. Um, You're a better person than me. I'd be like, <laughs> good luck. Bye. <laughs> at first, I was like, I don't mind helping you. I'll help you for free. She was the one that was actually insisting to, on paying me. Mm. And I was like, you know what? I don't even know what to charge. All of the questions that every entrepreneur, I think, has. Like, I don't. The value of something that comes out of you organically, it's hard to put a dollar on that. True. Mm-hmm. So, we we settled on a number. I'm glad we did because it it was a lot more work than I thought it was going to be. Mm-hmm. But she's still a client to this day, and it's been uh, at least two or three years, two years, and she's still a client to this day. I've, I've she's also introduced me to new things I could be doing by the question she was asking me. New things I could be doing for my own business. Yeah. So um, you were a business relationship manager at LinkedIn, mm-hmm. which is like the company that we think about, as Shana said, when we think about like networking and business and like career advancement. Do you have any takeaways for us on managing business relationships from your role there? And also like, what did you learn at LinkedIn that you have incorporated along the way with the new advisory? Yeah. Prior to officially starting a new advisory, I spent 18 years in sales, account management, client success, those types of roles where I was managing portfolios of 
uh, clients around two to three million dollars worth. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah. So, okay. No big deal. <laughs> no big deal. <laughs> MBD. <laughs> and I had to upgrade them and sell them on more stuff. It is a great learning ground. If, if you haven't considered sales and you don't know what it is, I would highly encourage you. It's also very lucrative. I would highly encourage you to look at that as a role because you learn so much about so many other businesses. Mm. Like I really got to, I got to be inside J. Crew. I got to be inside L'Oreal. I got to sit at the table with their executives and hear how they were deciding to run their business. Right. Mm. There are times where I'm like, you sure you want me here? Right. Yeah, you're telling me everything. You're telling me a lot of secrets. (laughs) So you were able to to learn even about like retail. Exactly. And all these other kind of business focus. Finance, retail, travel. I mean, you name it. That was in my portfolio at some job at some point. Mm -hmm. And I always managed to be on teams that were like the key account teams or the premier team. So you have access to senior level executives um, internationally and you're talking to them as if you, you're getting them to do things and motivating them or persuading them to do things that, and you don't even know them that well. And mm-hmm. I think that is the, the key thing that I bring into a new advisory is you're dealing with strangers, how, how, to, how to work with people and not take it personally, but also make progress towards your goal. So whether that's career transitioning, starting a new business, there are things that people can do better for themselves to represent themselves with a stranger Mm. who can help you get to that next step. Mm. And that's helpful because, you know, you've, like we said, you have single-handedly helped JJ and I negotiate a lot of things, whether it be business or personal, to be honest. Like, I feel like there's times I've come to Joss and told her a dating situation and she's like, well, have you tried to approach it this way? You know, like, and it's... And you're like, huh. Huh, no, I didn't. I, I just planned on ghosting him, so good job. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I don't ghost too often, guys. Um, so knowing that, like, what are three things that you think about before you approach any kind of no- conversation or negotiation, whether it be professional or personal? Mm-hmm. I think that... Whenever it's possible, do your research, if, especially if it's professional. Mm. There are There's too much information out there. LinkedIn is a great resource, but there are just regular Google. You can find out things about the person, about where they work, that can guide your conversation so that you sound more intelligent. I think it's also important that everybody, I know it sounds a little cliche, but work on their own, I would say, elevator pitch or their own way of talking about themselves. Right. Um, because I think that too many of us go into conversations with strangers and we and they say, what do you do? Or, you know, they ask us any mundane question and we don't have an answer. Mm-hmm. And that person could actually help you get to the next step. Mm. But you're not prepared to tell them what it is you're about. Mm. And when I say, the third thing is when I say what you do, Think about yourself comprehensively. I think that's one of the biggest things I work with clients on is don't think about yourself in terms of your past or your past position, especially if you're trying to get somewhere new. Mm. But think about yourself comprehensively and all of the talents that you bring to the table and then come up with like two sentences, three sentences to explain that so that Mm. no matter and and do it in in advance and you don't have to use the sentence the same way every time you can, you know change it up as you need, but having a clear idea of how you identify yourself is so helpful. And you'll you'll be so surprised at how many people rise to the occasion of helping you if you position yourself well. Right. Yeah. I remember one time we were sitting together and you were helping me to revamp my resume and you brought out like all these things that I had taken right. off of it. And you're like, what do you mean? But that goes to your umbrella term for like everything that you do. And you helped me to like see the value and discover that through line that you're saying like that um that weaves through like all of our positions like comprehensively like you said thanks i mean that to me is the most fun i feel like you it's hard to look at yourself and see certain things so working with someone else i think whether it was me or some anyone it is easier for someone else to look at you and say no this is great and that's great where we diminish ourselves uh, so naturally i'm never gonna I'm never going to lie about anything on your resume or in your profile or anything I write for you, but I am going to highlight it with great adjectives mm-hmm. and great words that show you it do. In a I was really light. feeling myself after you finished my resume. I'm like, ah, 
excuse me. Like, I literally walked into my new job like, y'all need me. I don't need yes. to be here. Do, have you seen my resume? And do you think maybe that's my favorite like part. A, maybe that's like a self-fulfilling thing there where like if you kind of highlight those things that you have done, mm-hmm. it kind of pushes you to meet, to, to yes. realize what you are good at and to, yes. and to step into it. Yeah. And I think, again, it's partly thinking about yourself aspirationally thinking about yourself in the present and the future not so much as the past because when you see like i do know how to do x y and z i haven't learned everything there is about it but i can say i can do some and talking about that favorably does wonders for your self-esteem like you said and also for other people Mm -hmm. they're not going to know anything about you other than what you tell them in these business situations so choose the best stuff right and you're really great at connecting your network. I feel like I've I've gotten so many benefits from you just being like, oh, seems like I know somebody at that company. Let me reach out. So what what tips do you have for us to keep our network active and useful? Because mm-hmm. we all know a lot of people, but I don't think that we use them to well, our benefit. Yeah, this is something I learned from years and years of sales. The first few jobs in sales, they make you call 50 to 80 strangers a day. And you're trying to communicate with them and get them to engage with you. So it really takes away the fear about reaching out to someone you barely know or that you haven't talked to in a long time. So it is something that's a trick of that trade. But I do think that there are a few things I would recommend for most people with their own networks is one, nurture them. Don't just wait until you have something that you need mm. to, to, to reach out to someone. What does that look like? Um, I just had an old colleague reach out to me. We haven't we haven't seen each other in two years. Uh, he's another LinkedIn friend, and we probably haven't talked in at least a year. We do like each other's posts, mm-hmm. <laughs> and and this is this is important because I think not only have job opportunities come to me this way, um, even in a new, but even previously, just doing little things like congratulations on your new job. Try not to sound like the you know, the auto message, um, because right. now they have all these mm-hmm. auto messages yeah. built in. Try to be a little different, but I celebrate other people. I think that's a great and easy and a feel-good way to keep your network warm. Celebrate other people's success. Don't say cliche things. Say real, genuine things mm. to them. You and Sometimes I'll text people instead of just writing the mm. message on LinkedIn mm-hmm. or on whatever tool I'm using so that they know it's personal. Um, so I would say that's the first thing. Celebrate other people. Don't wait until you need something to utilize your network. The second thing that I do that is probably the most important is when I reach out to people, especially ones I haven't spoken to in a long time, I remind them how we know each other. Great, you know, it's been so long since our days at Forrester. (laughs) You know, something to remind them so they don't have to go looking through my profile to be like, oh, I know her, but why? Then I ask for something easy. I don't ask them for a job. I don't ask them even for a (laughs) referral. I feel like a lot of the clients I talk to, they are oftentimes overextending their network by not starting with baby step, Mm -hmm. which is, I haven't talked to you in a few years. Let me ask you for something simple. My favorite question might be, I'd love to know what it's like working there. Folks love to answer that question. It's like an easy thing for someone to help you with. So I'll reach out. I'll remind them why they know me. I will ask them something easy. Once we're talking, I have you. (laughs) Right. Now you've already opened the door for communication. I can ask you a few more questions. What happens when you know someone who wants you to connect uh, them to somebody in your network and you are skeptical on... What attaching will come, them yeah. to yeah mm-hmm, and what will mm-hmm. come out of that connection <laughs> um that this is, i'm sure this happens yes. to you before because this is the business that? etiquette part yeah, exactly. yeah that's How, hard to know what do you do because you really like this person but you also know that they might come this sounds specific <laughs> <laughs> no, there's a lot of detail right? here there's a lot of detail <laughs> they might come with things that you specifically know how to handle and kind of manage the relationship with, but mm-hmm. th- th- your connection might not be prepared for when dealing with this What person. color shirt were they wearing? <laughs> <laughs> it was a beige. Right. right. They was wearing a beige button down. <laughs> yeah. No, that what is would a, you do? That is a great question. Not only has that happened to me, I'm sure that I've been on the re- on the receiving end where maybe mm-hmm. someone didn't have a great relationship with me and was trepidatious about referring me to a Come on, a trepidatious. <laughs> <laughs> we're so smart. <laughs> What's wrong with you? <laughs> Get out of here. And the thing is, I feel like it's my goal, at least, to try to be honest. 
You know, I'm not, I don't want to just lie to someone to, to protect their feelings. So being that I do this work, sometimes I'll, let me help you get ready mm. be, for this position or this person, because there are some things that I think could help you. So, mm-hmm. I, you know, I don't just say, oh, you stink, you know. There's nothing <laughs> or no, I won't connect no, you. No, I won't it's connect like, let you. let me prepare you for the connection. Yeah. And then on the flip side, I might do that with the other person. I was just reading, I read a lot about uh, diversity and talent hiring and all these things that are changing the face of how we bring talent in. And many times they talk about how how uncomfortable the hiring process is, how what a poor experience it is. And so what I'm trying to do is, and they also, one other thing they talk about is that someone who's not a good fit for one job might be a great fit for another job. And that's been true in my career. So I don't want to project that you're going to be bad at your job because I know certain things about your personality if I could at least set you up to shine on your own. So I'll do what I can to set you up to shine on your own. And I will, if I need to, I will let the other person know at least a little bit, but not enough to shoot down your chances. Yeah. Because I do think that you could, that could be the place that grows you. And I don't want to make the decision that you shouldn't be there. Yeah. So, and then one more question, speaking of like business etiquette. I, I do remember another time fairly recently <laughs> where I had to turn down an opportunity and I kind of panicked a little bit because I, I like the the people like they seem nice but Mm -hmm. the opportunity just wasn't for me um and that was also i felt some things that they might could learn from the situation um and you i came directly to you and like you helped me to like figure out what i wanted to say and what i wanted to get from this interaction with 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 this entity um so thank you for that first of all and secondly (laughs) you handled that situation so gracefully on your own i Barely did I don't anything. Know. You did a lot. You basically drafted my email, but <laughs> <laughs> um, so what? I guess because one thing that we like to do on your business is um, have people come away with takeaways, mm-hmm. right? So when it comes to like digital correspondence, what are like you know a few takeaways that you would leave our listeners with as far as like things to be mindful of when handling tricky or like mm. tough topics over email or text? The first thing that I think everyone should know by now, but it seems they don't, is don't push send. Write it. Hold on to it for a day if you need Mm. to. Let someone else read it. That's a word. Seriously, I don't understand people. Even with literally everything. (laughs) Twitter. Like, don't push send. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) You can write it. Like, if you need to get it out, sometimes that's enough to help you realize, okay, now my feelings are out Mm -hmm. outside of me. I can go back and write something a little more sensible. People be losing their minds when it comes they to digital. They go crazy. They do, like what? <laughs> like you're yeah, losing they their spill minds. everything okay to, say to me. Yeah, because they feel protected by the screen. Right, and that's the deception of the whole thing. So, yes, the first thing is write down. Write down what you're going to say. Maybe don't put the address in there so you don't accidentally send it. <laughs> but just write it down. And if you need to, like you did, ask someone else who's not emotionally attached. So that's the second thing. Ask someone else who's not emotionally attached to your situation to read it. And then the third thing I would say is if you tried, if you're aspiring to be a kind person in life, like a life goal, gentle and kind, then go back through your email and say, is this as nice as I can be while still being assertive? Or ask a nice person. That's what I yeah. do. <laughs> <You're so laughs> That's clever. <laughs> I asked Jocelyn because she's like just a little calmer and kinder. And then she's like, well, maybe instead of the first thing, you know, like maybe instead of like approaching it this way, you can like bring it back a little bit. So, And you still, I do not want people to be doormats. That's not mm. my goal with the mm-hmm. being nice. It's, and in fact, I had a recent situation where I was on a group thread and someone lit me up on this thread and what did I, and I took it offline. I took it separate. I took the email, forwarded it back to this person, but only with one or two people on instead of the six. Mm-hmm. And then I did one, what we used to call nice, nasty emails. Where right. It's, cl- it's all nice words, but I'm being like, maybe I should take a step back. So searching for a job is awful. <laughs> like, it feels awful. It feels so daunting, especially if you are cold applying and it just feels like you're, like, throwing your resume 
off a rooftop and it's just going wherever. <laughs> Not a rooftop. Yeah, like that's when I was job hunting. It just felt yeah, like I was the rooftop and then the you ground was into all a paper garbage. Airplane. Exactly, and you're just like, I hope you like message in a bottle. Like yes. I hope somebody finds this. So what is a what, what is something I can do to make a job? my job hunt more effective. Mm -hmm. I love talking about this. I learned a lot working at LinkedIn about how recruiters experience Mm. what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And I realize we're like ships passing in the night. So one, I do not apply the same method to every job. I often tell people I approach it like we approach maybe applying to college where you have your reach schools and then you have everything else. Pick a few companies that you really want to work for and put a different type of effort on that. And then the other ones, you can just push send, send those in through the ATS system, which is the applicant tracking system. But keep in mind that the minute you push send, you've taken your multi-dimensional, colorful self and turned yourself into a one-dimensional piece of paper that looks like every other piece of paper. Right. Mm-hmm. So now you've taken everything that makes you unique and made it hard for the for the person on the receiving end to even see it, which is not your fault. It's the system. Mm. And so what I started to see, and this goes back to one, what we have going on in the news around this this college scandal, but two, Ugh. what happens in a lot of companies. Yes. Uh, but it, it, a lot of what has happened in the world is nepotism, mm-hmm. network, and for those of us who are coming from places where maybe we don't have that network established through our parents and grandparents and uncle, you are at a disadvantage right. because you don't have someone to hand deliver your resume, which is the point of nurturing your network. So I take a different approach with the jobs I really want. In fact, I just did this and it worked beautifully. I had applied for a role and because I every now and then flirt with going back to corporate world, <laughs> I applied for a role did not hear anything. This company talks about how they want to create a different type of recruiting experience. Didn't hear anything. The job's been posted forever. So clearly, you're still mm-hmm. looking. And af- and I reached out to different people in my network, tried to penetrate that way. Not really any great response. I finally printed out my resume, put it in a hard envelope, put a cute post-it note on it, and sent it to the hiring no. manager. Oh, yes. First, you're, this goes back to doing research. I figured out who the hiring manager was or who I thought you it was. You better be so a detective. Good. Yes. All this, you see all these people going online to figure out what their ex-boyfriend's doing. All, you got the skills. Like, just use it for something good. <laughs> right. Well, just read them then. Right. Just, like, drag us all then. I just got off Instagram this morning. <laughs> Who would you talk on Instagram? Nobody. <laughs> Mind your business. <laughs> Go ahead. But it's really true. It's like we could use those same skills we're using to for social reasons to get jobs. And so I, I found her name. I wrote pretty much the same cover letter I had submitted, but I put a cute co- post-it note on it. And I put it in. No one gets mail at work. Right. Bar- barely does anyone get mail that's interesting at home. So she got she got it the next day. And then wrote me that day and was like, I got your message. So cute that you did this. Oh, my when gosh. When can we talk? Yeah, I'm like, go back to basics. So wow. there are We're so things. glad to have you on our For side. Real. Girl. But For I really real. think that people, I had a job that I got where I want to say before they saw my resume, I had been out to drinks with them. I had been, I met the manager for lunch because someone was a plot who worked there i had worked with previously and the reason he went out of his way was because there is a hiring uh referral bonus right he told me later he was like oh i've made like a couple grand referring people yeah now we had a great working relationship so he didn't mind but those are the reasons why you have to do a little bit different than just applying online. Like you mentioned, throwing resumes off a roof. Right. You can do that for some <laughs> jobs. <laughs> it's really so true. Because it is. Like you're like, psh, yeah. psh, paper they airplanes. all just like fall down and people are walking over them. A resume cannon. Yeah, that's, yeah. What, it, that's what it feels like. Especially yeah. when you don't hear back from anyone. You're like, okay. No, it, it, it is degrading mm-hmm. and it's depressing. Mm-hmm. And I think many people, that is one of the reasons they end up in jobs that are below their 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 ability because they go for the easy thing they can get an easy yes for um i had one more and then we have to let you go soon but so you also like will snatch a resume and like clean it up so well so i was hoping that we could get you to give us like one or two things that you see on resumes that make you cringe or things that we just like should not be doing or should be doing because i think it's hard to know um kind of what your resume should look like for you to get noticed Mm. 
an easy thing. I don't think you need your address anymore. Um, I know we, we deal a lot with bias. And so I've had some some clients who actually use their middle name and different things to try to avoid being taken a short route to the trash can mm-hmm. because it's real. And so I take I just do city, state, and and then my email address and phone number at the top. So make it clear how they can communicate with you. I would also say don't go too far unless you're actually in the creative industry. Don't go too far to make your resume into some artwork because you're making it hard for they only spend 4 to 6 minutes reading your resume. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry, 4 to 6 seconds. Seconds. Let me correct Ugh. myself. 4 to 6 seconds. Yeah, so, which is no time. <laughs> so if you've put things in new places that aren't normal for a resume, you are wasting your 4 to 6 seconds. Mm-hmm. So I actually go with very standard resumes where your name is at the top, your contact information is at the top, and then it goes through experience and then it goes through your education and then anything else. So do I need an objective still? Ah, great question. I don't necessarily write an objective in the sense of here's what what I'm trying to do or mm-hmm. what I'm after, but I do write a statement about myself or my what what I bring to the table. Because if you read nothing else, I want you to look at my resume and quickly know what I'm about. And then sorry, one last thing. Thank sure. you notes. Thank you emails. Mm-hmm. Like are those a must? Should I send a card? Should I is an email okay? Like, what's the etiquette around that? An email is okay, and I would say an email is a must. You never know that where this person and you may intera- interact in the future. You might come back around and meet them at a future job. So it's just good etiquette and it's good best, best practice. It doesn't have to be long. I prefer, especially if I've had an in-person interview, to mention something they said. Mm-hmm. I think we did this. Mm-hmm, yeah. Like, mention one thing they said. Mm-hmm. Because if you show that you care and you're still in the running, that could tip them, that could put you over the over the top right um hey, written cards are great maybe not for everybody but they're great if you yeah. can go that extra step i mostly look at it as a prompt thing i want someone to get a thank you note from me within the hours or at least the same day that i met with them well thanks for helping us get yes to the next yeah. i know you're so great and this is everyone to do well really helpful stuff and we know you have to run but we appreciate you so much for coming I in today yeah, we love you very love much. you thank you joss you're welcome thank you for having me bye. of course bye Jocelyn is so humble, but also has like so many gems to drop. Like if I had all those gems, you would know it. I would be like, boom, like right. every time I, I would said just walk it. around with a list of them. Exactly. Sure. But she's just like, guys, no, like this is nothing big. My favorite part was when she read us all. And she right. said, if you got time to go look up some other Instagram <gasps> or Facebook or wherever. You then can you got go. time to research before you go on a job okay. interview. I loved it. Yep. So that was good. All right. Now it's time for our last segment. It's our LLC, which stands for Learn, Love, or Canceled. Mm -hmm. And it's where we just like give a wrap up of our week of something that we learned, loved, or canceled. So I will go first. I am loving and learning Turks and Caicos. Yeah. Is that why you're all golden brown today? Wait, can I I just uh, interrupt your LLC for a second to tell... Not if it's going to be to shade me. (laughs) I had to tell y'all the text message I woke up to this morning. (laughs) First of all, this girl, she sends me a message and I say, cool. And then she responds with a dark skinned, a brown skinned thumbs up. Yeah. You are not. That is the emoji that I use. Well, and I don't I've care been how much you tan. I went to Kekos. tan. I got tan. You are not dark as me. I moved up an emoji <laughs> scale. Well, take it up with uh, the Unicode Consortium or whoever <laughs> they are who makes the Because I can't the use the old one anymore. You'll be back to the old one in like Ooh! a week. Anyway, is this my LLC or not? Nah? Sorry, go back. I'm back. I'm back. Um, so, yeah. So, this past week, well, last week into this week, I went to Turks and Caicos with two of my really close friends. Without me. <laughs> yes. I wasn't, the, I wasn't one of the close friends. <laughs> he wasn't. Um, but it was my first time there. And I will tell you that going to a place where the local population is 90% black is like, I, I felt I felt this way in Jamaica. I'm gonna say it. I felt this way in Jamaica. That is like my, what what I want my heaven. I feel like to be. you say this every. Time. I do. I love it. It it was so nice and welcoming to like get off. And you know, there's always nuances because unfortunately, a lot of those are very poor places, and like that is hard. But 
just stepping off the plane and I didn't see not a person that wasn't black that didn't also get off the plane. Mm. And it just was like, the you know, everybody was like, as soon as you get off the plane, I don't know if they say this to white people, but they said it to us. They say, welcome home. Mm-hmm. And that just like touched. Aww. I just felt I I did feel very at home. Like everyone was so nice. And then I think a lot of the tourists were white because Turks and Caicos is a very expensive island. Um, so I also just think that like they were whenever they do see black Americans come, they're like mm-hmm. very like everybody wanted to talk to us and find out like what we do and what we're into and like what being black in the States is like because they, you know, we met a guy there that use the phrase that when America gets a a cold, Turks and Caicos get sick, Mm. right? It's like they are really emulating what the states are doing. And when we go through a recession, they get hit extra hard. Mm. And when we have a surplus, they benefit from it. So um, that was just really awesome. And one of our last full days there, we took a tour of a cotton plantation. Mm. And that for me was just like, damn, like, Black, everywhere everywhere like yeah. slavery is a through line of black people everywhere and the saddest part is so you know turks and caicos is a british territory and they were part of the bahamas and then the bahamas went independent and then turks kind of it, it seems like a, a murky history but a lot of what they even know about their slave history is just what they've learned from the bahamas who have learned it from the british so mm. it's just like we just don't own anything to import a lot. And mm. so the cost of food is just out of control. We paid $9 for a loaf of bread because wow. the, what they what they can't grow is mild weather crops, right? Mm. Which is a lot of wheat and a lot of... And so they have to pay a 30% tariff on everything that they bring in. Yeah. And so food was just so expensive. And like even when we met locals and got to grocery shop where they shop, it was expensive. And we're from New York. Mm. So if it's expensive to us... Um, and you know, we met some Canadian tourists that came there to buy real estate cause that's what they do and scoop. Mm. And it's just like, uh, I just wanted, I want to be able to help and like, um, conch, which is like what I ate literally the whole time I'm, the, I'm there. I love conch fritters. I love I saw a just, lot of conch oh uh, my stories. gosh, like conch ceviche. It, I just love it. And that is natural to Turks, but it's been so stripped that they estimate in two or three generations that their kids won't even know what conch is. What do you mean stripped? Because we just love to rape and pillage a land. Mm. And so that's a resource that was always unique to them. But now they're selling it off in such mass to try to make money or people are coming and poaching it. And so it's just like, you know, it's to see all the blackness I loved. And everyone was so nice and warm and welcoming. Um, And then but then we saw black Americans and we didn't speak to each other. So Mm. it's just like America did a damn number on us. Um, but that was really my loved. I just, <laughs> I want to go back. I'm like still very like bummed to be home, but it was beautiful. And I like want to take my mom back. Like it just, it's a very small island. So everyone was very welcoming. It felt very familial. Mm. Um, so that was just my loved this week. I'm still on a very much vacay high. Cool. Yeah. Well, you look great. Thank and you. And I'm not salty at all. <laughs> <laughs> What about you? What's your LLCs? So I just have a couple. Um, I'll save. I want to do my cancels first. So I have one quick cancel, which is more of like a a sad cancel, which is um, that Johnson Publishing, um, which started Ebony and Jet Magazines, uh, filed for bankruptcy recently. Um, But we saw that coming. We did, but but here's the thing: they they actually sold um, Jet and Ebony in 2016 to this Texas equity firm. Um, so Jet and Ebony will still be around, cause, so they're not they won't be affected affected by the bankruptcy filing. But it's just a you know just a sad yeah. you know occasion that this company was around for 77 years and you know the struggle to like restructure and get or get financing um to kind of come back out of it given like how important like jet and and ebony right. were to our lives and I, I still remember like helping my parents you know clean out the garage and like coming across like some like old like mm-hmm. um jet 
uh, magazines like from the 60s yeah um that have been like passed down from like their parents and like all these historic covers and like things that they covered um and not to mention like the jet beauty of the week mm-hmm. <laughs> like, it was it was iconic yeah it was iconic culture. and i mean I, I do remember like i used to kind of once i became a journalist like i i kind of like i mean i guess um uh, doesn't look so great on me now, but I I remember kind of poking fun at Ebony's story sometimes because they, at some point, kind of did not um, rise to the level of which they were mm-hmm. um, have been previously. Um, but even even with that, like they were always iconic. Um, so just wanted to shout out Johnson Publishing Company and cancel whatever factors led to them <laughs> having a final bankruptcy. Yeah. My love is just something that just brought me joy. I was feeling kind of um, shitty, frankly, uh, a few days ago. And then I woke up and was just scrolling through Twitter. And the um, amazing gift to Twitter that is Jack A. Harry of <laughs> 227 fame um, tweeted something that just... Oh, it just gave me so much throughout the entire day. So someone else tweeted, um, what's the most surreal encounter you've had with someone famous? And Jackie Harry retweeted this to come in and she said, Eartha Kid slapped the fuck out of me. <laughs> she thought I was sleeping with her boyfriend, which I was. Which I was. But I didn't know he was taken. <laughs> <laughs> But I can imagine Eartha doing that. Yes, like, everything you've seen of her. But I also want to know, like, so Eartha has to be, like, at least 20 years, 20, right. 30 years older than Jack A. But are you surprised that, that, <laughs> that Eartha's pulling, baby, right. yeah, Eartha's little baby boyfriend was out here? Hold on. But then somebody else tweeted her. They said, um, I'm just shook at the fact that there's a man with enough juice to successfully holler at Jack A. Harry and Eartha Kitt. And then Jack A. commented on that. She said, he didn't just eat the girl. He restocked the shelf. <laughs> Get out of here, Jack A. You nasty. So I just loved it because it was just like a thread that was just like so so black and mm-hmm. like like you can just like all these people who you know are like in black media and like comedians and stuff were like and you know just black users, Twitter users in general were just commenting on the thread with like gifts and like and and memes and and just like shookness and i just wish we had our own twitter it was just so so that no one else could benefit (laughs) from this family because this is a family conversation that happens at the barbecue when everyone's drank a little bit and you start to get to hear all your stuff auntie did and you're like auntie why are you telling us that gets to monetize it right Mm. But, but I love that. <laughs> I'm just happy. I'm just going to rest in the fact that it, it existed. It happened, yeah. It is favorited. Yeah, I will what a time always, to be alive. What a time to be alive. All right, that's it. I'm glad we're back. I'm glad, Thanks too. for holding it down while I was traveling. Well, you know, I do what I can. Yeah, I appreciate you. <laughs> um, all right, y'all. So this week, please, please, please check the show notes. So we want to be able to communicate with you. So we're going to send... We're going to put a link in the show notes to a survey where you can... Number one, give us your email because we would love to have that to just be able to like give you the episode in your inbox um, or communicate things out to you. But then we would also love to know what you guys want to hear. We want to hear from you. Like we're not doing this just for us. We're doing this because we want to know like what are you out there business wise, career wise struggling with and how can like I'm sure we have a friend that can help. Mm -hmm. So please, please check the show notes this week. Also in the show notes, yeah. uh, please look at our Patreon page. Um, we would love your support and helping us put this out every week. You know, there are editing costs. There are, um, you know, equipment, equipment costs. costs and yeah. all that. And, you know, we love doing this so much, but we also uh, would appreciate any any help at this point because we don't have, you know, ads at this point. We don't have uh, sponsors or distributors. Um, maybe one day, but for now. Hit up that Patreon. Yes, <laughs> So you can find us at patreon.com forward slash yo business pod. Right. Um, and there's also a link um, in the show notes for listener support. Yes. Um, so Any yeah. way you want to give. And follow us on Instagram and Twitter at yo business pod. Uh, we'll be posting stuff there too. Yep. All right. Love you guys. Bye. Bye.